Hi, is this Melanie? It is. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. She is an actress, a singer, a writer, a voiceover actress, an inventor, and she's done just about everything. We're very excited to welcome Miss Melanie Chardoff to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Oh, thank you. I'll try to live up to the the nature of your respectful introduction. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think we've ever gotten probably as great a response as we have with announcing that you were going to be on the air. And a lot of the response is from male fans who are in love with you. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> wow. Well, I think there was a time when I had my appeal to uh, the male gender, and it's very nice to know that in fantasy that continues. <laughs> well, it definitely is true, and I said this before you came on, and when I went to school, I never had a principal that looked like uh, you did in Parker Lewis Can't Lose. I mean, wow. Oh. Oh my God! Well, you know, makeup and, and high heels <laughs> and suits. I mean, they they made me look really great. I wish I could live up to that still, but I can't wear the heels or the, yeah. the tight little skirts like that anymore. But I'm holding it together. I have to say, um, I I know you can't see me, but you know, take my word for it. I'm holding it up pretty well. Well, the voice is At least definitely. My there. husband thinks so. <laughs> <laughs> Your husband, by the way, you've only been married like what eight years now. No, we've been married five years, and okay. we've been seeing one another for eight years. And to me, it's still very novel. You know, when you've lived this long, uh, you feel like a newlywed uh, for a lot longer, I think, than other people. <laughs> I'm just not used to having somebody around, you know, um, so much. It's been very interesting, this period, you know, because we go from feeling cuddly and cozy to feeling like we're in captivity with each other. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of married couples are going through that right now. We're very grateful that we have one another. And at the same time, we process our anxiety very differently. So sometimes we need to just get away from each other. And I'm very fortunate we have a guest house, so he has his office up there. Well, there you and go. I, you just yeah, answered my question. Because I was going to say, how do you get away from somebody when we're all in isolation? I know. Well, you know, we in California are fortunate to have backyards in a lot of cases <laughs> if we have our own home. And we have the great outdoors, which is an extra room, you mm. know, that a lot of people in the uh, winter states don't have. So That's true. So I've always felt like outdoors is another room. And since we are able to walk around and, and keep at a social distance from one another, I'm, our streets are very crowded. People and their dogs and their kids and their scooters and everybody's across the street from one another waving and say, stay well. It's a whole other kind of interactivity at a distance. So no. it's been very... Um, Heartwarming, you know, for all we're losing right now, I think there's something that's going to be very permanently gained from this period, the adjustments that we're making. And you know something, that's so true. Like, isn't everybody kind of getting together and, and we're, we're getting the homeless off the streets, which could have and should have been done a long time ago? I know. You know? I know. You know, I, I, it sometimes takes a crisis like this for all to drop our our priorities and get real about being human yeah. and smart and wise about life preservation and, and, and you know, humanity. It, it's really a, a pity that it had to go this far, but it's gratifying that it's happening, and I hope they can contain this. I hope people, um, we've, we've kind of made the curve flatten. I'm just hoping we're doing that now. Certainly it'll be well worth it if we can. Right, right. So... Before uh, we get into kind of uh, present day projects and stuff, we wanted to start off by talking about how you got started in the industry. Now, a lot of people may not know this, and but you actually started as an actress and a singer on stage, right? You started with the Three Penny Opera? Oh, that's, that's right. I, I was brought up in the New Haven community, and I took the bus one day and auditioned to play a, a young prostitute in the Three Penny Opera at Yale University and got the part and um you know i milked it i had a couple solo lines and a few walks across the stage and um i got a lot of notice for it and i could sing pretty well my mom was a singer and an opera singer so i had that soprano thing which worked very well for the score and yeah and that was it i was just forever hooked on being an actor and and being able to imagine other worlds and live in them for a few hours a night it was just uh, changed my life did you ever consider becoming an opera singer full-time? You know, I dallied with it because I had a trick voice. I had like a four-octave range when I was young. I was a coloratura soprano, which is in the stratosphere. You know, kind of like Minnie Riverton, I had that whistle top. Mm-hmm. Of course, it didn't last more than past my 20s, but mm-hmm. it was really a fun trick to do. And I seemed to want to, like, try everything. I also was up on point studying ballet oh. for maybe a week. 
And then I realized how much I'd have to do to sustain that arch and to stay up on my toes and how much I'd have to do to stay at coloratura. And I kind of got bored with it and wanted to go on to the next thing. So, yeah, I studied opera for a while. And, of course, I studied pop, which served me better on stage and theater. And, uh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm classically trained and yet known for... Um, Rugrats and Fridays. <laughs> it's just kind of ironic, but I think most actors you'll meet and talk to have had that kind of training. Anyone who started on the East Coast, anyway. Well, it's interesting that you that you dabbled in in you know singing and and had that range and everything. Because one of the things as an actress that people recognize about you is a your distinct voice and b your ability to do so many different voices. I mean, even the voice acting came out even when you were on Fridays. Yeah, I got to do a lot of characters, so I got to play little girls and demented old ladies, and I got to really work out my, my character aspects, which is, you know, I always felt like a character actor, even as a little kid. I never really felt like an ingenue. An ingenue was kind of a character I did, and a glamour girl was also kind of a character I put on. I don't know if anybody really feels like a glamour girl. It's all an affect and a construction of makeup artists and hairstylists. I don't think any of these glamour girls that... I knew back then, the ones that I was guest starring with on like Battle of the Network Stars and stuff like that, really behaved glamorously in their day-to-day life, you know, I think around the house we were all schlubs like everybody else. (laughs) But yeah, I did have a great range and it served me quite well. I don't think I really played myself until I was on Fridays and they put my name on the screen and that became my default persona. Then I just became this kind of smart-ass a uh, glib woman. Um, <laughs> that became who I was, and that's who I got hired to be for a while, except in different extremities, like the, the Parker Lewis nightmare principle. She was described as apoplectic, and I had never tried that uh, descriptor on for size, and I just went all the way with it. it. It was like a human cartoon that they wanted from this role. And so it was great fun to play apoplectic, which I had never tried on in my real life at all. It was really... You know, a lot of whites of the eyes, a lot of zaniness, a lot of smoking out the ears and (laughs) drastic behaviors. It was really, really fun. Well, you knew the secret of comedy, and that is, you know, even though you're you're very, very attractive, and that's for sure, because that's definitely been verified by our listeners, and I'll I'll say the same. You know how to laugh at yourself. Uh, For instance, I was watching a Friday sketch the other night. And uh, you had somebody do an impersonation of Congressman John Anderson from Illinois that was running for office. And you were doing the news and interviewing him. And he was saying to you something along the lines that I'm sure the reason you got your job is because you're attractive, but really you're not that attractive. And and, and you could tell, you know, that it wasn't getting to you. I mean, you could, with, with some actors, you can see beyond what they show on the screen that it's bothering them. And it really didn't bother you so much, did it? Well, I was kind of used to it because the writers would play these little jokes and they'd slip thin- things into the dialogue that I wasn't prepared for. Generally, I was doing the newscast cold and just re- reading stories that just came off the AP machine and that the, the writers had just thought up within the prior hour. Because we were live, they tried to be as topical and timely as possible. Yeah. So I don't think I... Um, I th- it was rare that I was surprised by things they threw in, and I think that line was probably thrown in at the last minute so I would be surprised. So I just tried to keep my cool and be in, unflappable as possible. Um, but yeah, I got used to um, everybody on that show being like a, a pranky little boy, a sexist, misogynist little yeah. boy. That's kind of that. We were sort of transitioning into feminism, I think we still are, very slowly. So um, Mary Edith and, and Brandis and I would occasionally play these haughty feminists you know, sort of cliched, stuck up, angry. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it was always a fine line between ridiculing and making fun of and putting down something we were playing and enhancing them and showing their awareness. It was always such a fine line. You know, the one thing I, I took from the show, and maybe it's just me, I, I think Fridays would really have a hard time now because wouldn't it be kind of considered politically incorrect in a lot of ways? Well, um, isn't everything. I mean, yeah. um, you know, uh, sensitivity is in the eye of the, the sensitive and the ear of the sensitive. I think every, every we're so factionalized now. You know, back when I was a girl watching the Ed Sullivan show with my parents, there was one kind of common denominator of comedy, you know, the Bob Hope, the Jack Benny, the Jackie Gleason. It was very broad, and it was sort of, you know, it was self-deprecating. Uh, Jack Benny was cheap. 
um, Bob Hope loved golf. I mean, they all had their shtick that men related to and women, because we had nothing else to relate to, would relate to it as well. And, um, you know, we all related to that. There were only three networks, so there were only sort of a couple styles of comedy. And then Laugh-In, of course, made broad female comedy yeah. kind of a, a new norm, which was wonderful, because up till that time we'd had Phyllis Diller, mm-hmm. who did that wonderfully, really broad character. God, she made me laugh. Um, but she sort of, you know, defeminized herself and made herself masculine to do that. That wasn't really her voice. That wasn't really her look. Mm-hmm. Um, and so comedy slowly began to shift. And I think Fridays and, and Saturday Night Live came on at a time where being politically incorrect was our whole strong suit to play. I think Reagan, you know, was uh, our our icon to tumble. Our whole purpose for a couple of years there was making sure he stayed out of office. And then when we couldn't keep him out of office, we knew it was time to go. Um, that's just the way, you know, it was. He was our, you know, we always poke fun at our presidents. Well, you know, so that easy. was the key thing. I mean, you, you had great characters in the fact that you got to do the news, and that was very important because the news was always important on Saturday Night Live. But then when you got to play Nancy Reagan, and I guess you were so known for that, that Rich Little so. did an album, and, and you did Nancy to his Ronnie Reagan, right? I know. What an honor. Yes, I did. We went on we went in parades, you know, with security guards running by the side of the car. I mean, I really felt I was there for a while. And then Patty Davis, her daughter, guested on the show, and um, Patty and I were kind of hanging out for a while. You know, she was in a rebel against the Reagans, yeah. period, when she was on Friday. That's part of the reason I think she came on the show, which made her very interesting to me. And she and I were kind of hanging out, but when we'd hang out and go to the movies, there were security guards flanking us, even when we went into the restroom. <laughs> there were female oh security guards <laughs> peeing next to us with their panties around their ankles. I mean, it was bizarre. We never had a moment's privacy or peace. But... Um, yeah, it was a very interesting time to be enacting the Reagans, and I also got to play Nancy Reagan to, to Johnny Carson one evening in, uh, I think, 82, just for a few beats, but it was still like, what an honor to work with these greats, you know, these great mimics. Mm-hmm. But for me, frankly, Terry, it was just the wig. I mean, it was, anybody could, you could put that wig on and become <laughs> Nancy Reagan. <laughs> put on a wig and a red suit and they put that makeup on you you look at yourself in the mirror and you just oh yeah i'm her and it was always all the political wives were sort of um slightly uptight and um kind of machiavellian you know that was kind of the energy i brought to rosalind carter and jackie kennedy and um mrs reagan and you know i was the tina fey of my day for a little while for sure for sure well you know having known mrs reagan's daughter you know uh, did you get to actually meet people that you impersonated, like the people themselves, uh, Nancy and, and Mrs. Carter? And well, no, I did not get to meet them. I don't think they had any desire to meet me at all. <laughs> I know that Albert Haig, um, if you remember, he pretended he was taking over the presidency when Reagan got shot. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know if you remember that period, and, and he came on and said, oh, well, I'm in control now. And um, we did a big number about how kind of insolent that was it's such a sort of disrespectful at a very you know precious and precarious time for the reagans and then he kind of talked about me in one of his speeches he said oh that naughty girl melanie chardoff on that friday show referred to me as you know this interloper and and then i thought my god i'm in the news this is absolutely (laughs) bizarre you know i was just a small town girl from a suburb of new haven and it was like, how did I get here? This is just nuts. I just thought it was... It was one of the moments where I thought, oh, things have changed. Things have really changed. If I'm being talked about in a political statement like that. But I often gave uh, Nancy Reagan carte blanche to imitate me anytime she wanted. <laughs> <laughs> that, would be t- that would be tit for tat. You go for it. You well, know, any, any time. You know, Fridays was known for, you know, being more cutting edge and edgy like we talked about. I mean, it was likened to and became kind of a friend of the, the new wave music genre. And, of course, you had people that you worked with that were up and comers like Michael Richards and everything. Was there ever anything that the writers brought to you? that you just said, no, you know what, no, 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 no. That's the line. I, I don't want to do that. Anything too controversial for Fridays? Um, I think there were things that offended the women <clears throat> that we refused to do. I remember there was one sketch about violence. Um, 
you know, like people were walking into a police station and then saying hello and getting riddled with machine gun fire. Mm. And um, Larry Charles, I believe, was the writer. Do you know of Larry Charles? Uh, not Larry, sure. Larry Charles directed Barat. He directed oh, okay. uh, Borat, I'm oh. sorry, and Bruno and, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen oh, yeah. films. He was also one of the writers on Fridays, and he was one of the writers on Seinfeld, and actually directed uh, Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm. And um, he had a very edgy sense of humor. And, and, and in this sketch, all the women were being, like, you know, machine gunned and raped, you know, with bullets. It was about, like, what if everybody just pulled out guns all the time and just shot whenever they were offended? And to me, this was, like, fomenting problems, and I, I refused to be in it. But everybody else was game to do it, so I just laid out of that one. But to me, I felt like it was too provocative and too frightening. It did not strike me as funny. But, you know, po comedy is so much in point of view. I, um, I had just come from, like, New York maybe a couple of years before, and I was a Broadway baby where professional deportment was really important. And I had been trained in improv extensively with um, Second City, who were performing at the Plaza Hotel, Plaza 9 it was called, and I got my training, like, from the best of the best teachers yes. in New York at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, it, the comedy was very different in the mouths of all of us on the show. I think we all had a slightly different skew. Um, and that, that, that sketch just really upset me emotionally. I just, I just couldn't do it. But it went on. You know, there was nothing I could do to stop it. But there was occasion for the three women to say no to stuff. Mm. There, there, was, there was two that comes to mind. That, that I think would probably cause women to scream into the stratosphere today. Uh, one I saw the other night where uh, you and, and the other ladies came to the door of a party of a bunch of guys <laughs> together and announced yourself as, hello, I'm a whore. And, <laughs> and you were offering Hi, your we're services. Whores. Yes. And here's our menu. So, so how do you feel about doing that at the time? I mean, was it... Well, we loved it because it was so shocking. And we were kind of dressed like Tupperware ladies. And to me, it was just a great juxtaposition of wholesome Americana. And, um, you know, men who were being kind of jerks talking about women like they had it all going on and then being confronted with real openly promiscuous women and right. then not knowing what to do with themselves. So to me, it was a joke on men, uh, which I always loved. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I actually loved that. We loved doing that one, first of all, because the line was such a shocker. Right. You know, said by ladylike women like Brandis and me, right. saying, um, hi, we're whores, and this <laughs> is our service. These are our services. Why don't you just what you'd like to order and, and the so, other one uh, you played a little girl and you were in bed and it was kind of like story time with mom and dad and yeah. you were asking about the Easter Bunny and they were explaining to you the that, it was, that it was all bullshit <laughs> but, but mm -hmm. they broke that third wall and told you that they were all actors including you and he broke through the set wall and everything and he revealed to you that people were looking at your body because that caused ratings to happen and everything and you <laughs> as a child didn't understand that you know that, that was a great sketch. I, I thought so, too. That was by Steve Adams, who was actually Kurt Vonnegut's nephew, ah. um, adopted by Kurt when he was in. So he had a wonderful, absurdist point of view. Perhaps it ran in the family. And a lot of my favorite sketches, which were like little plays full of social commentary, uh, were written by Steve. And that was one of his. I, I, that was one of my favorite to do. It was also one that became the premise for a film with Michael Douglas, I think it was. Uh, or was it Michael Douglas or Robert Redford? I'm sorry, they certainly don't run together, but I can't distinguish them yeah. at the moment. But it was about a, a, a happy couple in the suburbs, and they're just having a regular quiet evening at home watching TV, and a man, played by Larry David, knocks at the door. And uh, he says, is uh, your husband at home? And I said, oh, he certainly is. And my husband comes to the door. He says, I'll give you a million dollars if you let me sleep with your wife tonight. <laughs> And Michael says, well, uh, you know, what are the terms? And, um, and I'm offended. I'm just shocked. I mean, not me. It was Brandis, actually, who played the role. Mm -hmm. She's offended by her husband even considering that this man could procure her for a million dollars. And then I, I, as a neighbor, come beating at the door, and I say, was he here? And my, my neighbor says, yes. Brandis says, yes, he was here. I said, well, you've got to do it. He's the best lover I've ever had. <laughs> you know, if you, you have an itch, and he scratches it. He just is intuitive. He knows. And so then the wife is more cottoning to the idea of being sold. And then the husband is irate and says, well, how could you allow yourself to be sold? So um, that was another Steve Adams kind of social commentary, which actually got either stolen or accidentally usurped for a film, a feature 
filmed a few years ago. Well, you know, you know, the, the right sketch there. made me feel guilty because you you know you start out and you kind of like put your butt in the camera, and as a guy, I'm like. Woo, you know, and and then then oh, Michael yeah. then Michael Richards was like, well, you know, we do this to to get people interested. And then I felt guilty that that I went woo, and, and uh-huh. you know, so, it, so easily manipulated, uh, Terry. Absolutely, no, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, no, we knew how to manipulate and play with the audience, and um, you know, we women sort of commodified our our our, our objectification. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that women in that era always did. We knew that we could manipulate men with our looks. Those were the sorts of roles we'd play. Like we'd be the dumb blonde crossing the stage, and some man would seem victimized by our beauty and be drooling and collapsing. <laughs> and you know, it was tits and ass. That was the name of the game. At least when I was coming into comedy. And um, and that was sort of part of the game. We were satirizing that, and yet we were doing it yeah. at the same time. It was a very edgy kind of period. Nowadays, I mean, there's so many different fractionalized, you know, fragmented parts of comedy. I don't know if you guys have heard of the show that Larry Charles did. He was one of our writers. Um, he wrote Diner of the Living Dead. Oh, yeah. No, are you kidding me? Yeah. That, that's where we live. We love that kind of stuff. Yeah, which got us thrown off, off the air in several se- southern counties. <laughs> yes. That and, and the talk show called Women Who Spit. Yes. Where we'd, <laughs> yeah, we got us thrown off the air. I was shocked at, at, at how little sense of humor certain areas of the country had about about this or about our not being ladylike. Or, right. But you know, in, in any case, Larry you, Charles has done a documentary show. I don't know if you've heard of this, but I've watched the first five episodes. It's called... Uh, the dangerous world of comedy. Oh, okay. And he goes to hot spots all over the world and shows how comedy has been a survival uh, technique for people in dire straits. Like there's a one of the shows is about the Ebola crisis mm. and the humor that has generated amongst the healthcare workers in Liberia and how humor is like their life force. You mm. know, it's a survival tactic. To, to keep them witnessing what's going on with a slight remove, you know, a slight sense of humor. And he's done other ones where he's interviewed people who have been thrown, had, had acid thrown on them, and they're sort of self-deprecation and, and desire to be funny. And then in Saudi Arabia, it's all misogyny and homophobia. These mm-hmm. are the jokes that, that linger there. So um, he sort of, you know, points out how different comedy is all over the world. And even in America now, God knows, there's a disparity between different points of view on co- comedy that are almost leading to life and death circumstances. Mm. Um, we have dense, different senses of humor just between liberals and, and right-wing folks. Now, yeah, between the religious and the non-religious, it's just a very testy time. That's kind of the perfect time to, to mention what I was going to mention, because as we're doing this interview, Melanie, I am having listeners that are submitting you know, questions to me through email and private messages and things like that. And, of course, one of the top things that everybody's asking about um, so I'll just say it simply, and you can say what you may or may not want to say. Do you have any comments? And knowing how different comedy is to different people, how some think it's funny, sometimes it'll be inappropriate, what are your comments on the Andy Kaufman situation that happened on Fridays? <laughs> I knew you'd get to that. Um, <laughs> I think it probably haunts you, like like people are always... <laughs> it does come up a lot, and in my my you know multifaceted career of 50 years, um, that's the question that's asked most, and it's it's just amazing what kind of memory people have, and it's also because it's on YouTube, playable at any hour of the day. Well, that too, it wasn't uh, not reenacted in the Andy Kaufman Man on the Moon uh, movie that. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. And I didn't even get to play myself. That was a oh. disappointment. But in any case, um, yeah, this was this was one of those periods where I was on the edge about you know my professionalism, and and I had studied improv intently, as I told you, and one of the rules in improv is to make your partner's reality look good. So whatever your partner plays, you don't deny the reality. You go with it and amplify it. And uh, at the very beginning of the show that night, we were told that the final sketch we were doing, which was didn't really have an ending to it, which made me very suspicious, uh, Andy was going to use that sketch to totally blow out of the, of the of the, the reality. And so I was, you know, he's, and Jack Burns, who was our, our leader, our fearless leader at the time, said, I just go him. with it, just improvise, yeah. just stay in character and roll with Andy. We don't know what he's going to do, but we trust you guys. Go out there and mm-hmm. and do it, you know, do it. So I was anxious. I was playing um, a very prim and proper wife who's getting stoned for the first time. And um, we knew, we were 
you know, our, our loins were girded. We knew that he was going to blow out any minute. And it happened relatively quickly. Um, we all came, uh, let's see, who had gotten stoned? I think Mary Edith was the only character who had gotten stoned. Mm-hmm. And then Andy went in and he came out and he kind of stared at me and I stared back at him and I said, oh, here we go. And he was kind of demeaning the show and saying, I can't do this, I can't play stoned. And I, part of me was irate because I wanted to save the show and, and be professional and make the show look good. But another part of me knew I had to go along with what my partner was presenting, which was this was a piece of crap and you know it's stupid to play stone and so i was you know we all were sort of between a rock and a hard place i was trying to be ladylike i was trying to play the wife Uh, and i was also very nervous about what was he going to do because he Mm -hmm. can be violent sometimes you know he's a buddy of mine but i knew he'd do almost anything for laugh yeah he had a attention had a reputation you know you knew that yeah yeah and i'd known him socially we knew each other at the improv club in new york when i was struggling as a stand-up and he was just killing with his Mighty Mouse routine. I mean, he was a concept comedian. He was just hilarious, and he was audacious. You know, he had the balls to do the most detestable things. So our crew did not know that this was an improvisation that was semi-preplanned. And so when this uh, and, and, uh, antagonism started between Andy and Michael, they kind of leapt up on the stage and grabbed Andy, and, and they were red in the face and pinning him, and... You know, it just got really scary. And we were trying to go along with it at the same time, make the show look good. And mm-hmm. so I was I was just, I was embarrassed by it. And, of course, it was the highest rating we'd ever gotten. It was like a reality TV kind of rating. Right. I think we had more dialogue about that in the news than we'd had about almost anything else we'd done as this kind of upstart new late-night show. Now, Michael and Richards Andy. got up and, and grabbed the cue cards and threw them in front of Andy, inferring that right. he was stupid, didn't know life. I take it Michael was really pissed off, right? Well, we were all playing um, indignant and pissed off, even though we knew it was going to happen. We didn't know what form it would take. But uh-huh. um, Yeah, Michael, I have to say, to his credit, he's very good at playing angry, and you may have seen evidence in this of this <laughs> and other non-acted scenarios. He's, um, he's not a racist. He's uh, not a sexist. He's an equal opportunity angry guy. <laughs> angry. Anybody interrupts his creative process, he can get very um, hot-headed. Right. So that was a case where he felt like he was being stepped on. And even though it was within the, the four walls that we'd set up that we were going to blow out of this sketch, he was you yeah. know, playing the part of somebody who was angry and indignant. And then they almost came to blows, and Jack Burns jumped up into the fray, and Oh, it looked fierce for a while there, but I frankly was embarrassed about it. The, the, the whole throwing the water thing with Andy through the water, I, I'm used to that. I mean, I figured he'd do that. And then I was surprised little Melanie Chardoff put butter uh, and threw... <laughs> I cut. buttered a roll and yeah. threw it at him. I was, just gra- I was grabbing his throat, frankly. I, I wasn't clear what to do and still be a lady. Right. Know? I mean, I wasn't going to actually leap on him and pull his hair out. It was just not my style at the time. And I had tight skirts on and tight pantyhose, so it would have been very difficult to do. Right. But, so I'm, I just played the lady. That was my yeah. kind of shtick to do. So another another question that we got from our audience, because uh, you've worked with a lot of, of legendary comics, and uh, this question is, uh, can you please ask Melanie, does she have any fun memories of working with Bob Newhart or Peter Scolari when she was on Newhart? Oh, of course. Who wouldn't? What a dream. Uh, Peter is just masterful, loose and, and, I mean, professional, impeccably professional, and yet, like, also loose and spontaneous, which is a great combination. And I got to play his romantic interest as well as his therapist for time, and it was a total joy. Bob was, um, you know, an old-fashioned monologist who managed to become a pretty good actor on that show. (laughs) And his vulnerability was always just adorable. Like, I sort of gave leakage in my first therapy scene with he and Mary Fran that this series of uh, uh, the series that he was doing at the Vermont Inn was actually a nightmare that he was having in the middle of his other series. Right, yeah. And yeah, and, and Jack Riley played uh, my patient who was also uh, Newhart's patient on his first TV series. And I don't know if th- I have it on YouTube if anybody ever wants to take a look at it. Um, but Jack Riley comes out of my office, who played the crazy patient on the New Heart, original New Heart, and says, what are you looking at? You know, and I say, I have to apologize to you, Bob, for my other patient. I'm trying to undo the damage done to him by some quack in Chicago. <laughs> 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 That's sort of the first evidence of uh, this being a, a, 
parallel reality. And so I got to play lots of funny bits with all of them, with Tom Poston, with Peter, with Julia Duffy. I got to be her therapist for a while. I was sort of an equal opportunity. I think therapist. Peter Scolari really has good memories because, boy, that one episode, you laid one on him lip to lip. I mean, man, that was... <laughs> That was great. But that was all in the script, Terry. <laughs> all in the script. You're, you're such a good actress. You just made me believe everything. I, I don't know. Well, I must say that I think it is so we cool. We love dupes like you. We oh, yeah. Them. Yeah, I know. I think it's so cool that you work with Larry David and you work with Michael Richards, and, and then you got to work with him again on Seinfeld. You know? Oh, it was a yeah. pleasure. Yeah. Of course, I wasn't one of the funny girlfriends, unfortunately. My part was sort of a straight girlfriend to George. Um, I didn't really have the you know the low the close talker bit or the yeah. or the you know the low talker bit. I mean, some of the girlfriends had great sticks that were written in, and mine was just kind of like a straight mommy um, girlfriend who you know looked like a keeper, but it was not a funny role. But I I was doing it as a favor, sort of for Larry and for for the two Larrys actually. Larry Charles wrote that episode because mm-hmm. they kind of thought it up as a bit, and I got called on a Sunday. This was right after the '94 quake. I got called on a Sunday and came in on a Monday and shot it on a Wednesday, and, and it was just a really fast, fast-moving job. But how great to be part of the final Seinfeld. Yeah. Well, you I know... I mean, it was, like, it was like Robin Hood, actually. I mean, just tell you this one aside, that Larry got everybody, every friend of his he could onto that show. Right. And gave us all trailers and great meals. And uh, the show was prolonged from a half-hour episode to an hour-and-a-half episode. So the residuals were great. Seventy-six million people wow, watched that yeah, show wow. live that night. So it's been a little um, scholarship, actually, over the years. Thank you, Larry. And we all made out very well from our, our little walk-ons and appearances in that final Seinfeld. Very nice. You, you've had so many connections with, with Larry. I know Larry's a Three Stooges fan, okay? And he looked a little bit like Larry fine a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, he did. But you did got... Did he play him? Huh? Did he play him on Friday? I'm trying to remember. They did a I, huge I thing. I believe Larry I believe did, played yes. Larry Fine in a Three Stooges movie, if I'm not mistaken. No, I don't think so. Well, maybe hmm. it's something I missed. I, don't well, know. Anyway, I was in a Three Stooges movie. You, yeah, you no. definitely got to play with the Three Stooges, and, and you wound <laughs> up even getting hit in the face with a pie. Stooge mania. I think I, I think I hit myself in the face with a you pie. You did. Out of fear that somebody would hurl it harder. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know what? That's not that's smothering. It's not easy. Terry's taken a, a pie in the face. Yes. Yeah. Did I, you enjoy it? No, it was smothering. <laughs> we, we both had the honor of appearing in a scene with the Three Stooges, so it, it, it was virtually. Oh, yes. virtually, what do you yeah. Virtually, yeah. What do you mean? Well, I was I was I at a, a theme park, and they needed somebody to do something. They did a chroma key thing, and put me in a Three Stooges film. They put me in a butler outfit, and I got hit in the face with a pie, and I couldn't breathe. It was smothering. I mean, it's yeah, it's a lot of force. Not pleasant. Not yeah. fun at all. And it's all, but luckily it's no crust. It's right. all whipped cream. You right. know, but still, I mean, you could get smothered if it goes up your nose. You know, I, I, I got him. I almost died on a set, on, on the Parker Lewis set. They threw glitter in the air, and I gasped and inhaled, <gasps> and I was wow. like choking to death. And they said, What's wrong with her? You know, stop taping. And I could not breathe. I had a, you know, a confetti in my lung. Wow. And, and I mean, you never know what kind of stick is going to happen. I, you know, we don't get stunt pay, but that yeah. was really perilous. And fortunately, our director, Andy Tennant, grabbed me and he said, breathe through your nose. Just breathe through your nose. Don't panic. Yeah. And so I breathed through my nose, and eventually I was able to cough it up like a hairball. Wow. And uh, we could resume shooting. But yeah, these, these strange little teeny things that can happen on sets. It's really surprising. Now, I, I've got to ask you, we're, we're B-movie fans around here, and, and I don't even know if you've even seen this movie. But when you did Miss Musso on Parker Lewis Can't Lose, did you by chance see Rock and Roll High School Mary Warnoff as Miss Togar, the principal? Did you base I that on her? I don't hard? think so. Oh, okay. No, no, I don't think so. Um, no, I just went with the adjectives that Clyde Phillips provided, which were apoplectic. Yeah, there you and, go. Um, and, and narcissistic and all those great words. I think maybe um, Tina Turner was more of an influence. I had seen her in Mad Max. Mm-hmm. Was that the second film? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, she was kind of my role fo- model, as was Ava Perone, who kind of ran... Um, you know, I, I played a principal who ran a, a high school like a small South American country uh-huh. and wore great shoes and wore great suits. A lot of them walked away with me, by the way, including a wedding gown. Um, I, the designer felt sorry for me because at 40 I wasn't married yet, and he told me I could keep one of the wedding gowns that I wore. I got married twice on the show. I mm-hmm. don't know if you knew that on Parker Lewis. I hadn't been married in real life. I said, 
oh, this is so beautiful. And the designer said, why don't you keep it? Just take it. Said, really, I'm going <laughs> wow. to wear, wear this gown someday. And he said, sure you are, dear. Sure you are. <laughs> and as soon as my husband proposed in a bathtub in my mother's assisted living facility, <laughs> And I was wearing a shower cap and glasses. Oh, that's romantic. <laughs> the first thing I thought about is, I'm going to wear that gown. <laughs> I kept that gown for 25 years, like Miss Haversham. <laughs> I have kept that gown in my closet in plastic. And sure enough, I wore that gown. saved me like $1,000 at my wedding. Mm-hmm. Well, Parker Lewis had a great cast, a bunch of great young people. If I'm not mistaken, hey, we were involved in another show you were in. And I think some of the writers or some of the production people on Parker Lewis wound up working on Weird Science. Is that right? Yes, I was in Weird Science also. I played the mother, I think, the second season. Yeah, now... Um, About three or four episodes, I think. Kind of interesting, and let me ask you as an actor how you feel about having your role be able to have this interesting dichotomy because Mrs. Donnelly, that your character on the show was, you know, they were well to do and she was very reserved and stuff, but there was one episode that you were in of Weird Science that was called Party Monster to where you kind of got to flip that switch and go from being reserved mom Mrs. Donnelly to becoming a young teenager type of going after, you know, the young kid Gary Wallace. So how is it for an actor to be able to play both sides of the fence? You know, Tiffany, I don't remember that at all. <laughs> I have like so many thousand episodes and scripts that have gone by. I, I don't remember that at all. I, but um, if you say I lived it, I guess I have to <laughs> amnesia about it. I know that that was one show where I put my foot down about saying things that I didn't think would come out of the mother's mouth. Right. Yeah. You know, like referring to young women as having hooters and, and things <laughs> yeah. like that. I, I, the, the show is kind of in my opinion occasionally vulgar yes no. um because it was a show for horny young boys let's face it <laughs> and so there were certain stands i made on that show and because i'd worked with the producer before he was uh, lenient and gave me my gave me my way so well another question from the audience i mean you did a lot of tv of course you did stage uh but your very first feature-length film was something that's very close to our hearts uh, because it's about a very famous DJ, and that was in American Hot Wax. What was it like doing that? And also, that was your first big feature film. W- were you nervous? Um, no, I loved it. And I got to improvise, which was really, really fun. I only had a couple moments on camera, actually. And a lot of the stand-ups and actors that I knew and was working with, like Jay Leno, uh, were on the show, are on that film also. So um, it was like old home week, just fun. And it was fun to play a little girl. I think I was playing Patience or Prudence from some 50s group. And, um, no, it was just thrilling. No, I, I haven't really felt nervous. I feel more comfortable sometimes on camera and on stage than I have in life, in all honesty. Well, you kind of were I, a rock and roll chick anyway. I understand that you were a go-go dancer uh, behind the Crystals and the Ronettes. It, yeah, but that was when I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> And I couldn't make a, a living babysitting, God knows. And I just, I was dancing at a bar mitzvah with my girlfriend, and um, Phil Spector hired us to back up. He was trying to get the Ronettes to, not the Ronettes, the Crystals, to cross over and have more of a, a you know, a white audience. Mm-hmm. And so he hired white go-go girls, like wholesome white go-go girls, mm. to, to dance in the cages. And so I got to do that a few times. It was fun, and it paid really well, like $15 wow. an hour. Yeah, yeah, but that was money. that was hazard pay because you had to work with Phil Spector. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was hardly he was hardly there. He was the the manager, but I don't think he was oh. actually there. But I just knew that he had arranged it. Um, and this is when he was just like a nice Jewish boy who was in love with uh, Ronnie, his wife. Right. And, you know, who knew what would happen to him? Oh, gosh, it's just interesting the, the desperation that people go to yeah. when they've been celebrities. I mean, they just need to have attention or. They need to have intensity in their lives. Right. It just sends them to drastic ends. Well, we want to go to uh, you today, but before we do, we've got to mention, because this is kind of in your past, but also in your present, because you're still doing it. Uh, one of my listeners in, uh, made sure that I remembered that you are the second person from Rugrats <laughs> that I've had on the show. The other was E.G. Daly, 
Uh, oh, she's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, she played my son for, you know, there you 30 go. years. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I, I don't know what she's like in person, but she was live in the studio in person here. And even when the mic was off, she continued to uh, talk in her Rugrats voice. I mean, always, always, just, always in character. Always, Tommy. always in character. Always Tommy Pickles. Oh, she's, she's so fortunate. You know, I have this pure, trained, colored tour voice, but she has that wonderful edge in her voice, you know, that some of those girls have. They sound like smokers, but they're not. Right. And she has that wonderful edge that I can do by contorting my larynx, but um, she just has it so naturally. I was, frankly, doing my mother... Um, who talks like me, only about 78 RPM, just a lot faster than I do, and speedier, higher vibration. <laughs> but um, I loved her voice on that show, and um, a lot of the girls talk like little children, the women that play those roles. They're just yeah. incredibly talented. But th- that show has such a huge cult following. I mean, were, were you surprised? Yeah, because we did just like a season or two, and then it took off in reruns, and they brought us back several years later, and it was just astonishing how how it had taken off the ratings had risen and risen and rerun and and it's like a it's like a, a an icon now it's just mm-hmm. it, it's just a remarkable shelf life this show has now i, I wanted you to tell our listeners a little bit about because I, I, hopefully you still have these dates coming up I, I know that the world is kind of on shutdown right now uh but i believe you had some dates for the summer but tell our listeners what is charismatizing oh 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 this is um something I started teaching in New York many years ago. I use improvisation to help people uh, find their charisma, their personal charisma. And I do it, I coach people on Skype. I work with politicians and religious writers and folks who tend to be introverted and introspective in their, their lives who suddenly have to come out and sell, sell, sell. So I work with people in my improv classes who are entrepreneurs but shy. Uh, who don't know how to speak on mic when they're required to or not used to being on camera. Um, And improv is a great teaching tool for that, to help loosen people up, to help them find their senses of humor. I find the sense of humor essential to survive on this planet. Absolutely. Yes, yes. You know, it's kind of like, I call it the seventh sense, the ability to witness what's going on and take a different perspective in the moment so you don't get traumatized. I think that's how I survived my own life, was to constantly witness and think, oh, I'll laugh about this later, and how can I make it funny for myself now so I can survive it? Right. So um, I teach that in my charismatizing improvising classes. I've had art gallery owners, attorneys, a lot of psychologists have studied with me, because since they play the straight man in all of their work, they like to go nuts and play the crazy person in, in improv. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have, I'm not doing it right now. Okay. God knows we're shut down. Right. But I'm hoping to revive my classes at some point so well, we can all be socially in contact. It's very, it's a very interesting uh, methodology and, and ideology uh, to teach and to learn because especially now in this time of our, our lives as a human society and dealing with coronavirus and everything else, being able to try to find or, or deal with different sides of comedy to help you get through it, that's very important. And as a matter of fact, I just wrote this song today I'd like to read, and I'm hoping that it, it strikes some people as funny. It struck, struck me funny when I wrote it. Um, it's from a, uh, a great-grandmother to the young people in her family. May I read it? Absolutely. The floor is yours. Okay, you may, you may not like it. You can tell me that afterward. You may get call-ins from complaining people. But at the moment, this struck me funny. I don't know how many days it will. Um, it's called, Is This Person Worth the Germs? We raised your folks to protect their hearts, to ask lots of questions before a love starts. We tried to keep them the marrying kind, told them look close before love drives you blind. Then condoms, diaphragms, birth control pills made our kids think they could beat all our ills. We warned them be careful about holding hands. Now you girls say hello and then you stick out your glands. And today the stakes are higher still. You guys get too close and one cough could kill. So before you get took by some new date's good look, take some smarts from your wise old great-grandma's book. Is this person worth the germs? Is this person worth the germs? What's the risk in getting kissed? Is this person worth the germs? Mr. Charm saw no harm in kissing up Carmen, who he met at the beach yesterday. Now here's what he'll do, go to bed with the flu and waste his whole summer away. Is this person worth the germs? Is this person worth the germs? Is Mona worth Corona? Is this person worth the germs? Forget STDs, it's the viruses, please, that lie beneath all of the radar. 
Bob may like her now, but from his feverish brow, he'll find lots of reasons to hate her. Unless she is a nurse, things could go from bad to hearse. So he should have called a doctor before he went in. Doctor! <laughs> Uh-oh, have they turned you off? No, 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 no. we're uncensored. Not yet. Go Not for yet. it. Beth, Beth, salmon's full of mercury and chicken salmonella. Eating cow can drive you mad, so before you kiss some fella, think of the germs. Sure, condoms stop a lot of ills and pills the morning after, but one reckless small infection could end your whole life chapter. Today, the wisest tactics, full body prophylactics. So stay lovesick or get toxic from your forehead to your coccyx. If your gonads have been nomads and you've survived this long, just abstain, just sing this refrain from your great-grandma's song. Is this person worth the germs? Is this person worth the germs? Is Cyrus worth a virus? Is this person worth the germs? Is this person worth the germs? Is this person worth the germs? Is Rufus worth the mucus? Is this person worth the germs? I could go on and on. Is Shep worth the strep? Is Lydia worth chlamydia? Is Sherman worth the vermin? You know, it goes on and on. But anyway, I think I've done it. Very wow, good. it's perfect. Yes. You, you need to put that on like YouTube or, yes. or maybe a Facebook Live thing. Well, that could trend all over the place. It needs a rewrite and it needs some music. So if any of your listeners want to give me a, a composer's uh, you know, v- version of this, I'll be happy to share it. And grab some okay. of those bands you had on Fridays. You had like everybody on there. So <laughs> I know. I don't know if they'd be interested in writing a little rhymey dimey doozy like this. But you know, seriously, anyway, just, you're in my head really? because I, I was just thinking it is true. It, this day and age is crazy. To, to get a disease or, or to have a virus, you used to have to have somebody come to the door like you did and you said, hi, I'm a whore. You know, but nowadays, you know, I know. all you got to do is shake hands with somebody. It's a, it's, a, it's a crazy world. I, I don't know. know. It's going to be very hard for young people right yeah. now yeah. because, you know, this is spring. Right. And their fancies turn to love and lust. I mean, I was young. How to hold yourself back from even touching somebody you care about. It's going to be harder for them than for folks, you know, who are middle-aged like right. me. Well, Tiffany had mentioned some dates. Uh, do you still have dates that you're going to be doing things at? Or? or is it kind of on hold? Yeah, everything's tabled right mm-hmm. now, Terry. I, I can't say when it'll be sa- safe mm-hmm. for us to meet again. But I do do coaching on Skype, Perfect. which I've always done. So people want to just prepare to give a speech online or whatever mm-hmm. they want to do. I'm very Now, if people uh, want to book a, book a session with you on Skype or whatever, how would they contact you or reach out to you to be able to book something? And they go to playdate four 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 at gmail.com uh, you can go to my website and book through that uh, venue also I have a website called Melanie Chartoff oh no I'm sorry I have two websites one's called MelanieChartoff.com which is about my acting career the other one is called Charismatizing with a Z dot com and if they go to the classes and, and coaching page they can sign up there but Playdate is probably the easiest way most direct way to get in touch about the classes or now, about the, the coaching. One thing the epidemic can stop, and that is you finishing your book. Now, you're writing a book, right? Well, I've actually uh, finished a book. It's called Odd Woman Out, and it's, it, we're in negotiations with a publisher just as this thing shut down. We're still in touch virtually, and there's talk of an e-book, rather a Kindle book, uh, and an audio book rather than a, a hold-in-your-hand book, which mm-hmm. may be the new trend forever. Who knows? Um, so it, I have I have an offer, and I'm very excited about getting the book out, getting it on my head and into other people's heads. It's uh, kind of a um, an overview um, over the last 50 years of my changing attitudes. Each chapter is a turning point. There are 33 chapters. My thoughts on acting, on sex, on romance, on motherhood, on marrying. And um, I think a lot of people will be able to relate, even young people will be able to relate about how, how to prioritize your survival these days. I mean, it's a lot harder to make a living for young people these days. And how to choose where romance fits into all that. Um, but it's funny and it's heartbreaking and um, people like Elaine Boozler and Lorraine Newman are, are blurbing about it for me. John Goodman is writing me a blurb. Betty Buckley, a lot of my old cronies are writing me blurbs to the book jacket. So right. I'm excited. I can't wait to get it out of me and it, into your head. Well, I, I think comedy is a genre where other female comedians uh, support each other. I mean, they're not all snarky like with actresses, right? Or are they? <laughs> oh, no. No, no, no. Well, at least my friends. I mean, we all really support each other. and We've been there for each other over, you know, 40-year periods. I mean, I've, I've worked with all those folks. They're all fantastic. I'm awed by them. I mean, one of the things I'm most gratified about in my life is that 
I know so many talented people, right. and I've worked with so many talented people. To me, that is true wealth. You know, it's less about the money, and it's about the the joy of working with geniuses. Well, I, I love so there. Much. There's a YouTube interview with you. It seemed to be like some local talk show or morning show or something. You were on the panel, and you were a co-host, and on the show was Phyllis Diller and Rip Taylor. Oh, right. That yeah. was a Bill Boggs, I think. Uh -huh. Bill Boggs show. Boy, you have done your research. <laughs> <laughs> so impressed. Oh, my gosh. And you do this for every guest. I mean, you must be busy. <laughs> it makes it better when we have somebody on we like, like you, because they have to research somebody <laughs> you don't like. It's, I, I, I don't know. Oh, well, but, now I have to do research about you, too, so I can say There you go. <laughs> well, I want you to know I appreciate what you said on Facebook about Jack Burns because I thought he was so yeah. great. And I didn't even realize at the time he was the announcer on Friday. I, mean, I knew him from well, other he things he'd done. He was co-producer, co co-director. Co-producer, yeah. writer. Um, he was like a Marine. You know, he'd say, kids, we got to go out there tonight and get this out on the... Uh, get out fast. I mean, he, he, he was the master of thinking up things at the last minute and right. making us stay up all night to rehearse it and write it. Um, but he saw a crisis. He was a real American Marine, and he was going to go into the fray, and we were all going <laughs> to fight with him. He was very high stakes person but he was adorable and he was a big supporter of mine and everybody else's on the show what, what about yeah. everybody else I mean do you still talk to any of the cast members or I wish I did we kind of all went in different directions mm -hmm. Mary Edith I saw a few years ago we did a radio show in North Carolina together love that girl but um, there was a reunion uh, at a hotel in the valley about nine years ago eight years ago and we all saw each other then and it was like we were weeping i mean we'd gone through so much together you, you can just imagine the intensity of working together seven days a week just for three years it yeah. was like a war zone and a, a celebration zone and um there was a lot of tears that night you know the crew was there um a lot of our producers were there and we had lost one producer during the making of the mm. show which was really heartbreaking wow. but um, it was fun. I saw Mark and Brandis. Mary Edith couldn't make it. She'd broken her leg, but oh. she sent a film of herself, which was great. But um, it's hard to keep in touch. We're all in such different directions now. Let me so, uh, let me John ask Rourke you. I, go yeah, ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say a question you may not be able to answer. Why do you think Saturdays was only? I believe it was three seasons. I think. Friday. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, why do you think? Fridays is not on the air. Saturday Night Live still is. What did they have that you think you didn't, or do you think you had what they did, but basically they got the uh, the, the press and the hype because they came out first? Well, um, I auditioned for that show, actually, and my friend Jane Curtin, who had been with the proposition with Off-Broadway, got my part, and I got to play the same part as the newscaster years later. But um, I think because we were handled by, we were produced by ABC, which okay. is the network, yeah. as opposed to an independent producer like Lorne. Um, and our, we were gunning for Reagan, and I think there were a lot of lawsuits against us with the network. And I think they got frightened and pulled the plug. It just got to be too much trouble. Also, um, Ted Koppel's show was a very big uh, hit at that time. Yeah, Nightline. He wanted, he, um, what was his show, Ted Koppel's show? Nightline, I think, show. or something, maybe. Oh, sorry, Nightline. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And he, um, he didn't like the imitation that John Rourke did of him on the show. And so he ha kind of had it in for us, and he demanded, since he was a heavy hitter at ABC, that we be moved and he get another hour and a half of his show. Mm -hmm. So I think there were a lot of politics at work. Right. So that was the sad story. But, uh, you know, we were all very tired and eager to go on to other things. So uh, for us, it wasn't, it wasn't a great tragedy for all of us. And they did try to do a, a primetime special, which I was on. But our sensibilities were not quite right. Our comedy sensibilities weren't right for an 8 o'clock. Well, and it holds up well uh, for your listeners uh, and fans of yours that, that want to know. Okay, you can see it now on streaming. It's all over the place. It's on Pluto TV. It's on Shout Factory. And uh, it's on Tubi. So you can still see all those episodes. And, and amazingly enough, the, the musical acts are still in there. You know, usually they edit them out because of, of royalty rights because they can't afford to pay for them anymore. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, certainly out of the DVDs that Shout Factory did, they edited them out because yeah. the, the licensing was so costly. But I guess somebody ripped it, huh? Yeah, I, I, I guess. guess. On Tubi and, and all those Tubi, places. All, it's, of it, all, of the, all wow. of it's there. We just watched a couple episodes the other night, and they had uh, The Clash on and, and Kenny Loggins. So. 
Right. Wow. I, I think that the cost would be prohibitive if they did it legally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this sounded kind of like an anything goes renegade era now. Where, you know, the internet is like the Wild West. You can like steal someone else's woman and kill an Indian, and they'll be and get away with it. I mean, it's right. different. So kind of era now. one last question from our, our listening audience. Uh, they said, can you please ask Melanie, knowing that she's done a little bit of everything, how did she feel about hosting shows? I know that she worked as a host with Fred Willard and also on Dick Clark's Where Are They Now? Well, um, it was okay for a gig, but I wouldn't want to make a lifestyle out of it. It's so much responsibility and actually so much research. Mm -hmm. uh, it, Fred and I did this show kind of blind, not realizing we'd have to read every book and, and study up on every guest five or six a day uh, before they came on, just like you guys have so professionally. Here. You're Thanks. gifted at this. Thank you. But, you know, I, I kind of got into this to escape from reality and be an actor in an imaginary world. I had a more imaginary world than a real world until I was in my 30s, I think. Um, so it wasn't, hosting wasn't, I mean, temporarily or guest hosting was wonderful, but no, as a lifestyle, it, it wasn't really for me. I couldn't do what you do. I just couldn't. Well, uh, in addition to you writing your book, though, you, you are still an active writer. You write for various other publications and forums, right? I do. I get published in a lot of literary journals and also things like Funny Times, McSweeney's, The Jewish Journal, which is uh, L.A.-centric but has uh, outlets all over the place. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy writing. I certainly have time on my hands now because I'm, I'm not acting as much. I wish I were. There just aren't that many roles. I played a wonderful role in a pilot last year. I'm not sure it's getting picked up. It's called Head Trip, and I play the mother of a psychotherapist who is battling a guru for the minds of the mm. uh, Miami Dolphins. Oh. So the Miami <laughs> Dolphins are all on the show, oh. and they go from guru to therapist. And so my therapist is this handsome, I mean, my son, the therapist, is a handsome young man, and I have just married a young man his age, so there's a lot of contention between my therapist's son and my jock husband. So it was a great pilot to do. I'm just hoping it goes somewhere. It's called Head Trip. We'll see. Well, yeah. I, I love the fact you make yourself available to, to anybody and everybody that's worthy of having well, you. Well, wait a minute. I'm a married woman. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking back to that, that skit. No, that, you were acting when you said, I'm a whore. Uh, no, basically, what I'm saying is you work for uh, the Jewish and, and uh, their uh, production facilities, and you've also done something for uh, Eternal World Television Network, the Catholics, too. So. Well, yes, I actually uh, co-created, produced, and co-wrote and directed a show called Extraordinary Faith, which yeah. is about um, the liturgy, art, music, and architecture of the aboriginal churches, you know, the Gothic and Roman wow. churches. Mm -hmm. And this host was a journalist from um, Detroit, uh, Alex Vagan, who um, had a vision for this show where he wanted to revisit all the stuff that folk music and rock and roll sermons were sort of uh, taking out of the picture. And so we went to the Mission San Juan Capistrano here in Southern California. We went to the uh, St. Charles Church at Harvard, these ancient churches, and shot on the spot there and interviewed priests and stuff about the changing nature of the liturgy. And, the, and I got to work with the Boston Boys Choir, wow, who are all great. on the verge of puberty, and all their voices are about to change, and they're trying as hard as they can to stay in falsetto. <laughs> that was a tragic story, actually. Yeah. Because at some point their voices change and their voices are kind of going all over the place for a couple of years before they hit their man's voice. Right. And so they have to be removed from the choir and for a lot of them this wow. was just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I, anyway, I learned so, so much. It was a great gig. I, I really enjoyed working with them. Well, as we say goodbye, I've got to say the coolest thing, though, you've done is, is and I know this goes in your family, you're an inventor. Yes, I have been. Yes, but uh, you know, all of us in improvisation are inventors. Of course, but I actually did. Yeah, but I actually did invent um, and had investors, fortunately, and had someone actually make the prototype, a gray water recycling device, which turns your shower drain into a dial, and if you turned your foot to the right, it would go into a tank for recycling, which I did not invent, mm -hmm. and if you turned your foot to the left, it would go to the septic tank or the sewer, like always. It was a very simple T valve. For some reason, nobody had implemented it yet. And um, Michael Bell, who played Boris on Rugrats, uh, to my Minka, invested with me. And it was our sort of folly. Cool. We had an attorney. It was a special, uh, it got a special speed uh, sort of patent because it was a, wow. an environmental product. But it didn't go Melly's folly. But my grandfather invented the vertical Venetian blind and the lazy Susan. Really? 
Wow. Yes, and then he sold the patents in 1929 when the Depression occurred. So. Now, if you could figure out a way to invent some kind of machine that would make toilet paper, we'd be set <laughs> because there's no toilet paper nowhere. So. Well, my darling, there's the bidet. Yeah, that yes, is there true. is. Yes, there is. Uh, but a bidet and a hair dryer, and you're all set. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, as we wrap up, uh, once again, uh, let listeners know where they can connect with you, keep up to date your website and, and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. You have two profiles on Facebook. So which one should fans go to to try to connect with? Well, it's, they're both called Melanie Chartoff, um, but one of them is for folks I haven't met. And that's why, uh, you know, I, I respond to everybody, but I, um, I also have a, fan, a, a, fan, a friend's page for people I've actually met and worked with. So they're two different ones. And if they write to me, they'll be, you know, put into one or the other. But I'm really responsive to my, my fans, and I do hope they'll write me. I like being in touch. Perfect. So we encourage all of our listeners to head over, connect with Melanie on Facebook. Also check out her website, um, because I'm sure as soon as the book is available, that is where they'll be able to find out about it, right? That one, that, that's good, Tiffany. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right. Well, Melanie, I want to thank you so much for spending a little bit of your quarantine Saturday night with us. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks so much for being interested. Absolutely. Um, and keep in touch and let us know when the book comes out. We'll make sure to let everybody know. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, have bye. a great rest of your night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.